the past 40 years, Stephen Brooks has become one of the most respected hypnotherapists in the world. He has taught many of the biggest names in hypnotherapy today and is even himself the subject of a book entitled Stephen Brooks and the Art of Compassionate Ericksonian Hypnotherapy by Joss Van Boxtel. Stephen lives in Thailand, and I am thrilled to have him here today on the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Stephen Brooks, it is so nice to meet you. Thanks for being here on the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. It's my pleasure. So for those of us who don't know who you are, and I include myself in that mix, because I just really am meeting you for the first time today. Um, Mm. How did you come to be uh, an Ericksonian hypnotherapist? What's what's your history? Where does this... uh, how did you come to today? It was really luck. I mean, absolutely luck. You know, in the UK, back in the 70s, um, no one had heard of Ericsson. Hmm. He was just not known at all. There was nothing published or available, you know, in the bookshops in, in the UK in the 70s. I was already starting or practicing as, as, a, as a hypnotherapist around about 76 Mm-hmm. Prior to that, I was I was in the music business before that, oh. and I decided to go into the hypnotherapy business because it was a fascination I had ever since I, and I was a kid. And uh, all the books that I could get at that time were very direct, very mm-hmm. authoritarian, and yeah. pretty basic, you know, uh, script-type books. Mm-hmm. And I, I wasn't very impressed with them, and, and I was actually thinking about, should I do this for a career? I, I wasn't enjoying it at all. And then I I went into a library and there was this book published, I think, in the early 60s called The Practical Application of Medical and Dental Hypnosis. Mm -hmm. And Erickson was one of three authors. I picked it up and I just looked through it. And my goodness, you know, I just saw these initials MHE under certain parts. And the words literally, literally, I can remember the feeling. They jumped off the page. It was just like, what? (laughs) <laughs> who is this guy? Who is this guy? I hadn't heard of him. I didn't know who he was or anything. Oh. But the, his contribution in the book just blew me away. I thought, this, this is unbelievable. Yeah, it's a great book. So, it is a good book. And it, it was the first, I think, that he was published in as a book, although he'd written papers and they were published through the various associations. So I took, I took it home and uh, I read it. And I never took it back to the library, to be honest. <laughs> I still have it. <laughs> 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 your overdue fees must be astronomical at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they're watching this, but anyway, so that, that was, that was the beginning. I thought I've got to find out about this guy. So um, the next thing that came along, I think was, was Ernie Ross's book, um, Hypno- Hypnotic Realities, mm-hmm. um, which was the first book he wrote with Ericsson. I think that was 71, I think, or 76 or something like that. I can't remember. So no, you no. got them while they're hot off the presses. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So I, I, I got I got that book. And then, I, of course, I thought I heard that um, Irvington, that they were doing the collected papers mm-hmm. and they hadn't been published at the time. Uh, Ernie was still editing them. And so as they as they were published, I had them sent over, wow. you know, one every six, one every two years or something like that. It actually took a while to get them. Uh, and I was still practicing as a hypnotherapist. And, you know, I went on I went on a training course initially, but it was so bad. It was really it was meant to be the best training course in the UK at the time, or, but it was or, awful. Or what sort of, uh, not an Ericksonian hypnosis? No, 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 that didn't exist. Oh, okay. There was, no, there was no Ericksonian training at all. Understood. Um, and I went on the course and it was absolutely terrible. So, and, and I mean, I'm getting this stuff from Erickson. I got some papers from him as well. So mm-hmm. I'm looking at this stuff and I'm thinking, my goodness, this is so far in advance of what I'm being taught and anything right. else I've read. So I started using the stuff with my clients and it just became, you know, I was very, very busy that, you know, it was about eight years before I started teaching. So I had eight years of uh, working with clients 
And, you know, to be honest, all, all my clients were my guinea pigs. Whatever I read about Ericsson. Yeah. You know, yeah. He rated a negative hallucination. Every client got a negative hallucination <laughs> that week. <laughs> so it was really jumping in the deep end. That's great. And I was so relieved to, to find that. And it just took off from there. Then later, later, um, it was, I think it was actually um, Robert Dills, I think. Um, he, they did an NLP course in the UK. I think it was 84 or something. It was mm -hmm. the first ever NLP course in Europe. Wow. And Rob, Rob was on the course. I did that course. And the reason I did it, because I'd heard through the grapevine that some of it was based on Milton Erickson. Mm. I thought, my goodness, you know, I've been doing this already for about eight years. And I got a, I was actually quite annoyed. <laughs> They'd stolen, They'd stolen my mentor. <laughs> you know what I mean? How wow. dare they do it? So I, I went wow. on the course, on the NLP course. And at the end, Robert took me to one side and said, you know, no one's teaching Ericssonian hypnosis here in Europe. You know, why don't you do it? So I started and then I, I started doing courses in, in uh, one of the hospitals in London, St. George's Hospital. Initially just evenings and then it took, then it was weekends and it just snowballed, snowballed from there. And by the end of the 90s, you know, so it's 15 or so years later, we were running courses everywhere and took a lot of stick actually you know because in the in the uk there was the the british society of medical and dental hypnosis which is only for doctors and dentists right and then i think the british society of clinical and experimental hypnosis was which was only for psychologists they didn't like anyone else using hypnosis right it was very kind of old school you know they wanted to keep it for themselves so I used to get a lot of stick because I was teaching it to social workers and speech therapists and nurses and all of that stuff. So there was right. running arguments uh, for a while, but eventually they, let, they had to let go because we were just training so many people. And that's it, really. That's the background. That's how I got into Ericsson. And that's how right. I'm still doing it now, you know, all this time later. So, yeah, not only were you teaching so many people, but doing it well and properly and, you know, with good, good training. I hope so. I yeah. hope so. I hope so. We, we've trained... If you look at who the main trainers are from the UK, I trained all of them. Wow. They all really? trained with me at one point. The Ericksonian people, yeah. Wow. You'll, you'll, find, you'll find that you know, the people who are actually running organizations and stuff like that, they all trained with me originally, um, mainly through the 90s, but then into the 2000s as well, early 2000s. Fantastic. Fantastic. So, yeah, I have a lot of pals, a lot of friends, you know, from yeah, all yeah. that time. Yeah. So you never met Erickson directly, though, so... No, no, I, I was due to Frank Farrelly. I trained with Frank Farrelly in Paris and oh, cool. we were both decided to go and visit Ericsson. And this was late seventies or something like that. Uh -huh. um, just before he died. And it was literally just before he died. It was about a week or 10 days before he died. Oh dear. And I got a, a phone call from Frank saying, don't come because uh, he'd received a call from Betty Alice or somebody, I think yeah. saying that her father had died. So he didn't get to see him either. It was uh -huh. just Bad timing but uh, there you go there you go close no cigar mm. <laughs> so you said you were in the music business prior to this what, what yeah what did you do there uh, well I, I when i was uh what 22 or something i was signed up by a record company as a, as a songwriter and recording artist huh. um elton john's company and uh that we made, I made an album and a couple of albums, and then I decided to go into the business side of things. So I, I worked as an engineer and producer for various people. Huh. Um, oh. And then I went, I went free. I was working for companies at the time, and then I went freelance, and it was tough because I, I, I'm not the kind of guy who survives very well in a cutthroat business like the music industry. So mm. while I was an employee, no problem. But when I'm having to get my own business and and elbow people out of the way in the music business, it's not just not easy, you know. So I took on hypnotherapy work, and that's kind of crossed over. So, yeah. So, how is it crossed over? In what way is it crossed over? How do you use what you learned in the music business or music ah, world from? Uh, well, I, well, I can tell you that, but I didn't mean it that way. But what I mean was I was doing production work, um, like, like three or four days at a time or a week at a time, then had like two months off. Uh -huh. So I, I was seeing clients in the evenings when I could until I had enough business, which actually happened quite quickly with the hypnotherapy. And then I, and I dropped the most dropped most of the recording work, although I still did some things early 80s. I was asked to do some punk stuff in the 80s when it became popular. But that was a that was a different Stephen Brooks back then. <laughs> I actually I actually was in London for a year from 19, uh, 
1980. I think that's right. Is that right? No, it's not right. It was 77 to 78 is when I was there. Yeah. And the, the punk scene was was happening. And I, I saw some of the early bands, you know, with the skin. Uh, hey. uh, gosh. <laughs> I wish I had rehearsed this part. Um, who were those guys? <laughs> There was so uh, many of the them. Sex Pistols. I saw the Sex Pistols. I saw um, Clash. I was a musician myself. I was over there studying at the Guildhall. Um, oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah so I was a piano player. So, yeah, it was funny. Amazing, oh, amazing. amazing time. We'd go from, you know, the, the classical music halls of the Guildhall School to, um, you know, Brixton and here. At <laughs> yeah. Or whatever. It was quite a, quite a culture shock, you know. Yeah. But, um, if, is there? Do you feel crossover between music and Ericksonian hypnosis? Not really. No. no. I mean, I, I one of one of one of the bands I recorded with back in literally in the sixties, late sixties. We have recorded an album during during lockdown. You know, just for fun. Uh-huh. But I, it's, it's never going to make any money. I mean, it's almost pointless job. It's a kind of a vanity thing, just for fun. You know, we did that. Yeah. Um, so I don't play anymore. No, I used to play in the blues jam sessions here, guitar here uh-huh. nice. in Chiang Mai in Thailand where I am. But to then um, the police came along and arrested everybody because we didn't have work visas. <laughs> well, <Whoa. laughs> seriously, seriously <laughs> we didn't have work visas as musicians. Luckily, so I wasn't there that night. Oh, I was going to say, so you're an ex-con then. I didn't know that. About <laughs> no, I wasn't. There. <laughs> I wasn't. Some poor guy who literally just got off the plane just arrived on holiday. He got up on stage with a tambourine and they hauled him down to the police station at the same know. time. <laughs> <laughs> and how was your trip, honey? How did you, how did you enjoy Thailand? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, no, no, it doesn't cross over anymore. But, uh, but I tell you, when, when you ask me that question, you know, somebody else asked me that question not that long ago in terms of has, has being in the music business or being involved in music helped me as a therapist? Mm-hmm. in the way I work. And I thought about this and I thought, you know, back then, Doug, you, you probably remember back then there were just like small mixing desks. Well, in the sixties, it was just four track. Yeah, yeah. And then seventies were eight track and then it went up to 12 and then 24. And now it's crazy. But back then, if you were mixing something, if you were producing a band and you only had eight tracks to work with, you had to overdub everything and sure. bounce the tracks around, you know, f- you know, to, to, know. to bounce it down. Yeah. And it was it required a lot of skill. But my experience of doing that made me always think ahead of what the what the consequences would be of my decisions. OK, cool. So that, and that, that really helped, I think, when I was a therapist, because all the time I'm thinking, like, where, where is this going to take the client? You know, where are we going with this? What's the consequence of this? If I do this here, what's that what's going to happen here? So it made me think ahead of the finished product, if you like, because when you're right. mixing something, you hear the finished mix in your head as a producer. Yeah. And as a therapist, you want you, you kind of get a sense of the finished result and how you work your way there. So I, I felt that was really, really I hadn't thought about it until somebody asked me. But I think what what about things like rhythm and tempo in the way that you deliver? Mm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And, yeah, and definitely. volume and pauses. One of the big things that I've noticed for m- myself, just if I may speak for a moment, <laughs> is, um, uh, as a musician, you know, the, the importance of silence is is kind of critical mozart used to say that you know the silences are important as important as the notes maybe even more so he likened it to the um the pattern of a of a piece of lace or doily you know he said without the holes there would be no pattern so without the silences you know there's no really pattern so i'm very aware of that when i'm doing hypnosis with someone that there's those moments of silence those you know pauses and places that seem to be so important so how does how do things like that out enter into your your way of well, doing? I, I think as as a musician, you know, you, you're always working with um, dynamics in terms of the voice. Of course, we use this a lot in, in hypnotherapy. You can imply something just with a subtle change of tonality, as you yeah. know. You can imply a different meaning, and I think all of that and, and the pauses. You know, there were so many, I noticed when my when my students. They just cram as much as they can in. They're, they're nervous to, mm, to mm. leave a space. They just kind of feel they have to kind of feel every moment. So I, I, it's, I, I emphasize how important it is to let go. I think a lot 
a lot of the work occurs when you're not doing something with the client. They're sitting there processing. Of course, they need to do that. They need the time and space to do it. So it's, yeah. I think it's very, very important. And I'm sure you must have seen Ernest Rossi work. It's nearly all silent. <laughs> <laughs> it's an, an odd, mm, yes, that's right. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, <laughs> he so... gets very well paid for doing that. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. But it, it, the principle is wonderful, isn't it? I mean, because yeah. you're totally re re relying on the unconscious mind to do the work. You're just setting the frame. Right. And, and allowing the unconscious to do it. And I think that's one of the most important principles in Erickson's work, of course. Yeah, I agree. And I think Erickson took it some time learning that himself from the readings that I've done of, of his work. He said, you know, he, and he didn't use the word jam it in, but he would say that he would work too hard in the, in the early days. And it took him time, he said, mm. to, to discover that, you know, he could allow the time to have the person process and really trust their unconscious mind. You know, to set the frame for them to do that work, but then trust that they would, in fact, do the work themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. And that is still still innovative. These days, it's still innovative. There are so many therapists who don't understand that principle. Right. Uh, it surprises me that they haven't got it because it's so effective. And Ericsson is so well known now. But there are so many people who are not familiar with that approach. I think it's a shame that, the Erickson techniques are not taught in other therapies. You know, you, you could teach even a massage therapist could use hypnotic language. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, you know, and oh, why, why? Yeah. Yeah. So why, why is it not taught on other courses? It's, it's quite surprising really when maybe because they, I think maybe because it's, it's still new for a lot of people. And number two, it's actually not that easy to learn. If, if you're learning in a more traditional rote learning kind of way, Right. You know, there's a limit to how much you can learn from a kind of a written checklist or syllabus or script with Ericsson's work. Yeah. A lot of it is literally you have to be creative and trust your own unconscious to that's create right. the stuff. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So maybe that, that's the difficulty that people have. Otherwise, it would be wonderful to see it. I'd like to see it in education. You sure. If, Absolutely. Of, yeah. The problem is the word hypnosis, I think, you know, the way the media have promoted it. Yeah, hypnosis. Oh, it's really right. dangerous. Yeah. So, oh, it's very true. Damn media! It's the media. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, seriously, it, it is the kind of thing that um, is difficult to teach, or, or be, not teach to teach, but it's easy to say and bring people to their attention. But it's hard for people to actually do it sometimes, um, because, like you said, they're nervous about saying the right thing, and they think that it's all on them. And they've got to say the right words and read the right scripts and do it at the right time. And that it's 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 amazing when you finally get to that place where you can say, "Stop talking," mm -hmm. and let there be that silence. You know, let that be. Then let them do that processing. Um, I actually, in my classes, I I, I make people um, count. So as if they're counting on a, you know, speaking on a four count, then they have to have equal numbers of silence <laughs> before they can talk again. And then we, we practice watching their breathing and they can only breathe on, only speak on their client's exhalation. Mm -hmm. So that slows them down, um, mm -hmm. you know, which is a great thing. That's a good so, principle anyway. Yeah, well, it is. Exhalation because, because you're going down with your exhalation. Exactly. So if you're, gonna, if you're getting someone to go into trance, you're not going to do it when they inhale. It won't be as effective when the body, the physiology is actually going yeah. down. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's that release of tension that's happening. So you're sort yeah. of acting you're concurrent. On it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So um, you are also a practicing Buddhist. Is that correct? Yes. Nice. So I have, I have been a, for a long time. You have been for a long time. Okay. And um, I have a question for you. I, I studied with a guy named Stephen Walensky uh, a number of years ago who, who was, hmm. I don't know what, what specific form of meditation he was working in. He said he lived in an ashram in India for many years. Um, and he came back from there and, and with the um, awareness in his mind, at least, that what having him studied with, with Erickson directly, um, he came back and he said that his experience was that the state of mind that over there in India they refer to as samadhi and the state of mind that Erickson referred to as a therapeutic trance were one in the same state. And I'm just curious from your 
experience of meditation for many years. And, and I uh, well, I think if we step back a couple of paces and think, oh. you know, what what is the outcome of hypnotherapy compared to the outcome of meditation? Okay, they they're completely different outcomes. So whether we enter the same state exactly, I don't think so, because the state is contingent upon context and outcome. Okay. You know, uh, it, uh, to give you an example, in th- hypnotherapy, people, when client comes to see us, they either want to stop something or they want something else to happen, something to start. Is stopping or starting something. That's normally their reason for being there, pretty much regardless of what problem it is, as you know. Right. Well, so they're coming in with wanting to attach to an outcome. They want to no longer smoke. Mm. They want to be more confident or they no longer want their phobia. They're attached to wanting something. Well, with meditation, it's about non-attachment. It's trying to get to a state where you're not attached to things. I mean, the, 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 the paradox is, of course, why would you even sit down and meditate if you were completely non-attached? Because you, <laughs> otherwise you wouldn't even bother trying to get good at meditation. You, there's right. a certain amount of attachment right. to non-attachment. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. So you have to be attached right. to non-attachment. And so I think that's the difference. You know, when you're in the state, what you're going for is in meditation is mm-hmm. to not attach to thoughts and material world, if you want to take it that far. Mm-hmm. But in, in, I, use, I use the principles in therapy pretty much all the time now as integrated with Erickson's approach because, you know, I, I use Erickson's skills to teach Buddhist principles, if you like. Okay. So let's, let's, hear, let's hear more about that. I want to hear more. You, you, in fact, call what you do compassionate hypnotherapy. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how does that work? Well, OK, first of all, the name compassionate hypnotherapy, what does it say? It says it's basically hypnotherapy where everything you do is, is based on compassion. That is, what is compassion? It's if you like, it's uh, unconditional love. It's, it's giving something without wanting something back, without any expectation of return. So that it immediately says that what you're doing as a therapist is not for you as a therapist. It's purely for the other person, even if the other person doesn't know that you've done anything. You mm-hmm. don't get the pride. You don't get the, the personal. Yeah, I did something good. So it means all of your focus of attention and care in intention is focused directly on the client, 100% of it, because you're doing it compassionately, number one. The second is to actually use compassion as a healing, you know, because compassion is love, obviously, but it's unconditional love. It's not a sexual love, of course, but it's real love. And we now know, as I'm sure you do with it, if you look into the field of psychoneuroimmunology, words can change physiology. They can change your T-cell count, you know, in your immune system. Could you just say that word again a little slower for our listeners uh, at home? (laughs) Okay. Psychoneuroimmunology. It's about boosting the immune system to heal, but using words or actions, something that would not be traditional, you know, like some kind of medication. And we know there's a lot. I mean, if you go back when I first started in the 70s, there was hardly anything on psychoneuroimmunology. The idea was still up in the air. But now there's so much research into Mm -hmm. the field. And we know that if somebody witnesses love, they don't even have to like the person who's, who's demonstrating the love to someone else. They may even not like them. They may not even like the person who's who's being loved. But if somebody witnesses that the witnesses t-cell count increases wow really they've done blood tests they've done blood tests to prove that just witnessing love in any form from one person to another will increase your own t-cell count and Mm. also the two people you're watching so if your whole mode of of therapy is done within that framework of compassion just by being with someone okay and the words you say come out compassionately then it's going to make a difference to the person in terms of their overall health and happiness and well-being. That's number one. The second thing is the Buddhist principle of non-attachment and uh, dependent origination, which is basically cause and effect. So there's three things, compassion, there's um, uh, uh, non-attachment, and then there's uh, cause and effect. The non-attachment is basically, the principle is in terms of the way I work, 
problems that people had in the past are in the past. Our own present representation of it is in the present. It's not actually in the past. It's in the present. We experience it in our brain. And so is there some way that we can not attach to the, to the hard wiring that went on back then in mm -hmm, the present mm -hmm, moment? Mm -hmm. Got it. So hypnotherapy based on creating non-attachment to the hard wiring that causes problems in the present. Rather than going back and reliving things and going through things, you know, in regression therapy, it's about working, working on how the brain is, has maintained that and then changing the way it functions in terms of like synaptic connections, but using hypnosis to do it. Wow. So these are Buddhist principles, basically. And cause and effect is, as you know, it, it means basically everything has an effect and that effect is then it's a cause for something else. So it's looking at how that has also enabled this hard wiring to continue. It's a cause and effect relationship like dominoes. And how can we disrupt that in some way and change that in some way? So mm -hmm. put those three together. And that's, that's the way that I work. Oh, that's fascinating. So a person doesn't have to accept, you know, um, Buddhist principles as a, third, <laughs> as a, they come to you for no. hypnosis and you, yeah, yeah. They, they, they come to me for hypnotherapy. Um, some people know that I work this way, of course, but uh, yeah. most of them don't. So, uh, and they're not preached to us. You're not teaching the Buddhism. Right. You know, you're not even mentioning that word. We're just using principles. So, right. the Buddhism is a religion, okay, but there's a faith and then there's the psychology. Buddhism is more of a psychology than it is a faith. And so, take the principles from the psychology of mm -hmm. Buddhism. There's a book, there's a, there's a whole there's a lot of writing called the Abhidhamma in, in Buddhist um, writing scriptures. And mm -hmm. that's all psychology, 2,600 year old psychology. So if you take the principles, the, the, the three most important principles, it took me a while to learn, learn that I could do this. You know, I, when I came to Thailand, I just meditated for a long time. I actually closed down my entire business in the UK when it was the most successful because it was, it was, uh, affecting me because I became a businessman mm. and it was uncomfortable, you know, so I just threw it all away, gave it all away and came to Thailand. And then after meditating, I wanted to know if there was some way I could integrate Ericsson's techniques, Ericsson's approach mm -hmm. with Buddhist principles. And that's what I worked on. And that's so that evolved. So the work I do now, if you watch videos of me working now, they're very different from the videos of me in the nineties, mm. the eighties. How specifically? Back then, I, I'm more pure Ericsson in okay. as much as he, uh, Ericsson, if Ericsson had been a Buddhist, this is what this is what he'd be doing now. The way I do it. <laughs> but if you think, you know, back then, you know, I was a Buddhist, but I, I was teaching in hospitals. I couldn't stand up and start talking about Buddhism, right. you know, to a bunch of doctors or whatever. So I was really much closer to the Ericsson's approaches and Ericsson's techniques that he used then. Okay. And, so, and something I've always avoided, of course, is, you know, back then in the 40s and 50s, the goals that Ericsson was trying to go for were very different from the goals that people have now. Mm. Back then it was, you know, you had, to, you had to get engaged, you had to then get married, you had to have 2.5 children, <laughs> you, had to go, you had to go to university, right, the whole American dream thing. Yeah. And that, yeah. that, was the, that was the template he placed around all the work, as you remember. So obviously that doesn't exist anymore. And so, you know, I've had to leave that behind. I, I never went with that one because it was far too, you know, I was studied in, in the 70s and 80s. So that had all been already in the past by then. So it's just really taking the skills and the techniques and then d adapting them and developing them in accordance with your, who you are. And I think that's what every student should do and every, every therapist should do that, not yeah. clone, clone someone else. So. Yeah, that's great. That's beautiful. That's really, that's, that's really enlightening. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm surprised I just used the word enlightening, but it is, <laughs> it is, it is informative. Um, w when you teach hypnotherapy, then do you, do you teach the Buddhist principles? I mean, how, I know you don't do it with the clients when they come in to see you, but when you're teaching, you know, let's say a new student came in and said, I want to learn how to do hypnosis. Um, would you then sort of say, okay, well, but first we have to do some meditation and learn how to do some Buddhist principles yeah. here? Um, no, 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 no. That's a separate thing I do. Okay. I run a training called non-attachment therapy. Mm -hmm. 
What's which, that? I mean, it's basically Buddhist psychotherapy with hypnosis. Okay, cool. Um, I mean, I, I, it's a, the last course was a whole year course last year. Um, and I decided to drop the Buddhism thing because uh, a lot of people think if, you're te- if, it, if you mention the word Buddhism, the training should be free because it's like a religion. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a religion. It's, it's a counseling and training. You know, it's a therapy right. course. So I, I've taken the most important principle, which is non-attachment, called it non-attachment therapy. When I teach Ericksonian, no, it's, it's, it's Ericksonian. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So who were your main teachers, would you say, of uh, live? Did you study with, uh, you mentioned Ernest Rossi before. Did you meet these people yeah. who worked with them? Yeah. 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 I, 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 well, Frank's not Ericksonian, of course, but uh, Ernest Rossi, um, David Kaloff, uh, David Gordon. Uh, gosh, who else is there? Um, uh, Virginia Satia, I trained with Virginia Satia. That was oh, lucky. Nice. That was yeah. fabulous to do that. Yeah. Um, Bill O'Hanlon, of course, Bill. Uh, so about about eight or nine of these trainers, and half of them ended up training for me as well. You know, when I when I was running my running my courses in the UK, mm-hmm. you bring the them mid nineties. Wow, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Fascinating. You know, it's funny because there's a lot, a lot of parallels. Um, as I've never met you before, but it's like, well, oh, I did that. <laughs> so I know that guy. It's, yeah. it's coming from the music world and then going into <laughs> hypnosis and, and NLP, et cetera. Uh, I worked in a hospital in the nineties. Um, yeah. you know, I did, I, I was doing hypnosis for patients prior to surgery. I was doing pre-surgical hypnosis. I didn't do a lot of teaching there. Once a year, I would do a kind of intro to hypnosis thing for the first year medical students at Columbia. But, um, you know, it, it didn't go very far as a few hours, you know, intro to hypnosis thing where it sort of show them basically that what they thought about hypnosis was not what we were doing, you know, and that it's a very different, you know, therapeutic hypnosis, very different from, you know, stage hypnosis or so, what they've seen in the movies. So were you working with, with anesthetists? Is that what you were doing? Um, I was doing pre-surgical hypnosis so that I was giving them um, like usually it was at least three days of hypnosis prior to their surgery so that they would have um, better surgical outcomes. Oh, so okay. Less, yeah. less bleeding through throughout the surgery, less, <clears throat> less discomfort, less, you know, pain, if you will, um, leading up to and mm-hmm. post-surgical. And, you know, one of the reasons it was, it was popular there is that people tended to have shorter hospital stays. So everybody mm-hmm. was happy. Um, they, the patients were happy. The insurance companies were happy. Everybody <laughs> to get them out of the hospital sooner was a big plus yeah. for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Well done. Well done. Well done. Yeah. Very good. Uh, it was very, it was, it was great learning experience. You know, I, I worked with this man for a while named Dave Dobson. Oh um, yeah. I trained with him. I oh, trained with Dave Dobson. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Then tell me about that. Where, <laughs> where did that happen? Well, I'll come back to my story later. You tell me your story. Well, I was in London, London. <clears throat> and before he came, before he turned up, we were all terrified. Well, we well were... placed. <laughs> <laughs> We'd heard all these stories about him, you know, and there was comparisons between him and Bandler, you know, yeah. uh, in terms of, you know, moods and, and his, his uh, approach or attack or whatever you want to call it. It's attack. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> Go ahead. It was great. It was great. He was lovely. Yeah, I, I thought he's like a big teddy bear for me. It was right. like. I don't know what people were scared of. He was like a big teddy bear. I tell me, you work, you work with him. Yeah, tell me about that. Yeah, I, I, I did my first training with him. I met him 1986, 87, maybe 86, I think. Yeah, it was 86. Um, at my first NLP training in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, somewhere like that, um, with Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins was teaching a 15-day NLP training. And Tony brought in, to his credit, you know, People like Bandler and Robert Diltz and various other, you know, major league NLPers were there. But he also brought in Dave and, um, you know, talk about (laughs) the difference. You know, Tony was like, this young guy, it's like everything's physiology and uh, no smoking, no eating meat. It's all vegetarian. Let's go run 10 miles. Uh, Let's do, you know, 
<clears throat> you don't need to sleep, just drink green juice. It was just an amazing thing. And then Dave, <laughs> and Dave came out and he's like, you look like kind of like Santa Claus, you know, this white beard. White beard. I love white beards just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> Although this is an audio podcast, if people could see the picture of you now, or you have a, you, you put Dave to shame. Your white beard is beautiful. Um, I saw him get part-time work at Christmas. <laughs> And the Buddhist red is it works perfectly for Santa. You could just say this is my my yeah, summer Santa. Santa yes, Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> that'd be nice to hear that because normally I just scare kids to death when they walk when I walk up, up to them. Oh no! They run away! They run away. <laughs> probably my Buddhist amulets that does That's it. it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just carry a big sack over your shoulder and go. Ho, ho, ho. People yeah. will be very happy. Um, anyway, so Dave walks out on the stage, and I. I in my memory, he's smoking a cigarette. I'm sure he wasn't smoking a cigarette when he walked out on the stage on Tony Robbins's seminar, but he probably had just put one out just before he came up on his stage. And he's, you know, this big fella, and he's telling these stories, and he's got this uh, kind of gravelly voice and talking real slow and, you know, just the opposite of Tony. But I found him absolutely fascinating. And uh, the stories he was telling about, you know, hypnotherapy and whatever, I, I just found fascinating. And I knew that um, everyone that I knew that had gone to see him said, yeah, I don't know what he did, but I, everything I do works better now. My NLP processes are better. I'm just getting better results with my clients. Everything's just more effective. So I said, okay, I'm going to go. And I went out to Friday Harbor the next chance I got. And uh, did a two-week fun shop with Dave. Yes, wow. Yeah. yeah. I did that a few more times over the course of the years. So I've worked with him quite extensively. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Envious. Envious. Yeah, it, was, it was good. It was good. He was a good, good teacher. Learned a lot from him. Um, that's one of the reasons, by the way, I, I call what I do neo-Ericksonian hypnosis, because I never met Erickson. I was fortunate enough to meet his, his wife and daughter at different points, Betty and Betty Alice. Um, oh. I've been to some Ericksonian conferences where everyone there had met him and I worked with people like you mentioned, Bill O'Hanlon, Stephen Gilligan, you know, those folks oh. who, who had, um, but I never met him himself. I did go to his house and sit in his chair and at the invitation of his, of his wife. I don't know, but it was, it was nice. He wasn't there. Um, at any rate, I was, I was in one of these Dave Dobson workshops. This is bringing me back to my hospital train. Um, and Dave told a story about, about um, I won't mention any names, but one of those NLP trainers <laughs> that has, whose name has come up already. I don't want to get in any trouble here. But so let's just say there was a person who is. <laughs> famous, I got it. <laughs> famous NLP person um, who also had somewhat of a reputation of, of it being scary from time to time. And so, um, Anyway, Dave, Dave had told some stories about working in hospitals, working with burn patients, working with in different capacities in hospitals. And, and then later on, I don't know how much later, but at some point later on, he heard this particular NLP trainer um, telling these same stories to the audience as if he had been there, done it himself. And then, wow. um, yeah, according to Dave, he went to said person afterwards and said, God damn it. If you want some experience, go get some. <laughs> so those, those words um, landed for me as Dave told that story. And so I decided when I had the opportunity to work in a hospital that I would do so. I didn't get paid to work in the hospital for the first several years that I was there, but I was part of a study basically to see what, you know, quote unquote, alternative medicines alternative therapies would be useful and uh, appropriate for use in a hospital setting. So mm -hmm. I was volunteering in this study. So I would wow. do three days of, of um, or three sessions of pre-surgical hypnosis and then a follow-up session after, after their surgery. You know, and that kind of intensive experience is invaluable. You know, a lot of people don't get that chance to be yeah. thrown in the deep end and they just have to, you have to get on with it. You've got no choice, right? Yeah. So that's an amazing way to learn because as you learn new stuff, it becomes unconscious really quickly. 
Yeah. Because it's, it's all it's all being thrown at you at once, so that's a wonderful opportunity. That no, was it was great. It was really great. And I, I will say, I think what you've just said is is part of the reason I think sometimes people have trouble with that that pause thing, because it's not gotten to the place where it's just ingrained in you and automatic. You know, the the, the skills, whatever, are not just like at your fingertips. Um, they they have to wonder what is the best thing to say in this script or in the script that I should have memorized. What's the script for this? I don't have a script for this. You know, they don't they don't know what to say. And so the idea of trusting their unconscious mind is like, I can't I trust it. I don't I don't trust it. I don't trust it. I'm not ready. So it takes some time, I think, sometimes at least, for people to get to the point where they can say, I can let go. I, I can trust my own unconscious mind to say or do the right thing in this situation where it is kind of the deep end. And I, I do need to you know, do the best thing for this client who needs me at this point in time. I don't know if you've ever done this. Uh, what I've done with when I have students who are really anxious, you know, what happens if they come out or am I even going to get to go into trance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What happens if I say something, it doesn't happen. You know, mm-hmm. I said, listen, this is the Ericksonian approach, okay, which means it's 90% indirect, which means the client doesn't know what you're doing. Your client doesn't know whether you're using the right language pattern or not. So think of it as the coward's way to do hypnotherapy. <laughs> the coward's way. <laughs> okay. Because you can't fail. You can't, right. fail. you can't say anything wrong because the client doesn't know what is right or wrong. Mm. So what I want you to do is just, first of all, think of the context, this frame. What is the context doing as a context it's a huge hypnotic suggestion if someone comes to see you as a hypnotherapist and you're just starting out the context is a suggestion Mm, mm. they're going to go into hypnosis so almost anything you do that they don't understand they'll interpret as being relevant Mm. to hypnotherapy so i just say to people just open your mouth and say whatever comes out whatever comes out just say it Mm. and create a story just make up a story without knowing what the story is about or how it's going to end, just start talking and just make sure you get the tonality right. So there's a a marked difference between normal speech and the hypnotic tonality so they can feel the difference. And it's amazing. People then feel like uh, they've got this resource of not having to make an effort consciously. Right. And of course that helps them come up with unconscious language and unconscious ideas that even uh, therapy itself it's got a shortcuts that whole process of being on the edge of a seat and not not knowing what to do and not being sure whether it's the right thing because that's terrible isn't it because what that client what the therapist is doing is thinking about themselves all the time yeah 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 for sure and that's that's the last thing you should do isn't it i mean you should be thinking about the client 100 percent. so this is a way of just getting yourself out of the way so yeah. i find that works really really well with with new students yeah great so tell us about that you know you you mentioned that and i certainly I feel like I understood everything you're saying. And I want to make sure the p- people who are listening to this who might not know exactly mm-hmm. what you meant. So when you say that the client, the beginning hypnotist needs to change their tonality. And so that there's a distinct difference between their sort of normal way of speaking and the hypnotic way of speaking. Mm-hmm. What do you mean? Well, if we go, go to the NLP principle of anchoring or any kind of, you know, uh, behavioral therapy it's based on on repetition it's based on um anchoring to a particular stimulus or trigger the voice becomes the trigger for trance if you actually slowly go into the hypnotic voice and you you slow it down anyway because of the client's breathing and it's, it's all about implication isn't it ericksonian therapy is all about implication rather than instructions unless it's giving a task where it may be more specific or more direct it's all about implication so when you use a, a more hypnotic tonality and of course you, you bring in pauses etc this kind of thing then it implies a different state and because you're doing it you're also putting yourself into a different mm-hmm. state you know i think i always tell my, my my students it's not a competition to see who gets into trance first but mimic the trance in yourself because you're Pupil dilation, your blink reflex, your breathing, they're all hypnotic suggestions that you're Mm. giving to your client non-verbally. And so when you 
do that. And of course, if you're if you're analog marking, marking stuff out with Rossi's interspersal technique, you know, this kind of thing, then of course you do need to be slower and you need to use your tonality to make a difference here or there, as, as you know. So it's really about, I think, making that client the most important person in your life at that time when you're working together. So not thinking, is this right? Is it wrong? Am I doing this the right way? But just trusting your unconscious and building competency and confidence from your unconscious and just giving all of your attention to the client. And I think this is relevant in, in any therapy. Of mm. course. Yeah. Coaching, any, any co coaching. I mean, Erickson's most important principle, as far as I understand it, is, is the principle of observation, utilization. You can't utilize what your client's giving you unless you observe the client. Mm -hmm. So you can't be thinking, you can't be thinking about yourself. You have to be totally committed to that person. And then it almost becomes like a dance. You, you, you know this feeling. It's like a dance where somehow you're almost reading their mind, not, not in terms of content, but you're picking up you know, on their state. And it's like a dance between you. It's almost like you have two unconscious minds communicating and you just sit back and observe it. Hey, hey, it's almost like that, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> kind of more. It's, it is like that, actually. You're a musician, Doug. I am. You recognize the feeling? from when I you, do. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah. Especially if you're improvising. It's not yeah. you playing, is it? When you're improvising, it's not no. you playing. Well, yeah, I very know. Similar. It is and it isn't at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, you know, and it is very interesting. You know, you say it's almost like you're picking up, um, you know, through ESP, their, their state, et cetera. I, I will tell you, there have been, and I'm, I'm, I can guarantee you, you're going to, you're going to recognize this experience as well. I will be sometimes doing a trance with someone and, and I will say something that I didn't plan on saying. I don't know where it came from. This image pops up in my head. And so I just say it. And afterwards, the person is like, I can't believe you said that thing about a white bunny. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Yeah. It, I it happens a, a lot. Yeah. It happens a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. And you know, the bizarre thing is you know that it's relevant. As you say, you say it and you think, well, I didn't think that. My mouth just said those words. <laughs> right. right? <laughs> and I know, I know now it's relevant but I don't know why. I don't know how it's relevant. And I'm not sure how that happens, to be honest. I, mean, I don't know. But it... but it doesn't happen if you're not in that state and observing. No. You know, uh, no. Stephen Gilligan once said that the three most important things in a hypnotherapeutic interaction are number one, to observe. Number two, to observe. And number three, to, <laughs> to observe. You know, that observation. And, and I, you know, when you're reading a script, or if you have your eyes closed and you're in your own sort of state, you're not observing your client. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I just wish all therapy had this mm. as, as the foundation for their work to observe and utilize what's happening yeah. rather than pigeonholing people. I mean, I go, I even go so far. I, I never book second sessions. Hmm. What, what I mean by that is, I even think, okay, if I say, okay, now come back next Tuesday and I'll see you next Tuesday. There's actually an implication that we haven't done the work well enough. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like an implication. So I, what I say to my clients is, okay, you come back and see me when you feel you want to contact me, either to let me know how it's gone or to book another session. So come back and let me know. But I want to know either way, whether you want to come back. And then the, Sometimes it's like two days, two or three days. Sometimes it's three weeks. They'll call and book another session because I think I think that's important because they it is also the implication that they're going to feel something. Right, right. They're going to notice something. Right. It's like you have to use every breath to to, to, to nudge people towards the changes they're after. Everything you do, every breath, every word, every smile, everything. I think that's Ericsson, isn't it? I mean, it's pure Ericsson. You use everything to to create this momentum towards change nice i hope so <laughs> <laughs> otherwise yeah. i've been doing it all wrong <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. oops 
that's funny. So you were you were a businessman, you said in in England, and then that um, made you feel like, ah, oh, gosh, this is not really what I signed up for. Let me let me get out of here. And you went over to Thailand and started meditating. Um, mm-hmm. Business, however, is part of the equation. People do need to earn a living as a coach. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we can't just give it away for free because it's called Buddhist or compassionate. Yeah. Or whatever, right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, so what, how do you, we've been talking a lot about what seem to be very essential coaching skills. So it's perfect for this podcast is uh, it's essential to listen. It's essential to observe. It's essential to, you know, be aware of your tonality All those things are really very, very truly essential coaching skills. What would you say is an essential skill for somebody who wants to be successful as a business coach. person? Yeah. Business okay. coach. A coach in business, or, you know, whatever. oh, a business coach. Okay. No, no, no. I mean, a, a person who's in the business of coaching. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, it has to start with the heart, okay. even though it's business. It has to start with the heart. First of all, you you have to really want to make a difference. I think if you're doing it just for the money, either you won't be good at it because your heart won't be in it. You won't be thinking about what the benefit is really, but for the other person, not for you. And, and number two, you'll get bored mm. because it's not you won't have any passion. So first of all, you have to have that passion to want to make a difference, even if you do it in a selfish way. Like somebody years ago, somebody said to me, so why did you become a therapist? And I said, well, I remember reading something Stephen Covey wrote, um, Seven Habits or whatever he wrote. I can't remember what it was now. Yeah. And he said, if you, if, you look, if you go on your deathbed and look back over your life, what will you not want to think? And I thought, well, it's, I would hate to think I didn't do enough, that I didn't make a difference when I could have done. Mm-hmm. Because I, that, that regret would be a, a, the worst emotion to have, regret that you could have done something you didn't. You could have loved more. You could have spent more time with your kids or whatever it is to, to pass on to the pass, pass on and have that emotion as you die would be awful. But imagine feeling, wow, I made a difference. I couldn't have done any better. That was the 100%. What an amazing feeling to have when you're dying. You, you would have no regrets. So mm. I think for me, that, that made me think about this in terms of, okay, first of all, it starts with the heart intention, wanting to make a difference. In terms of business, first of all, getting good results. Because I think in any coaching context, you know, you've got to build up a reputation. So you have to get good results may not always be consistent of course but if, if you're good at what you do if you if you're making that commitment to that person then you'll make a commitment to yourself in terms of training uh and, and continuously learning what's what works and, and is helpful so you will get better results you'll get good results and that goes a long long way in terms of business skills of course things have changed so much since when mm-hmm. i started in the 70s my goodness And I think it's almost impossible to keep up on a daily basis with marketing what happens. So for me, it comes back to, you know, what I do is I am I am the raw materials of what I teach. It's me and my work. So, you know, I've tried everything in the past, advertising and this and that and stuff. And I found the best way is just just to talk and say, right, this is this is a skill that I use and I'm going to teach it to you on a video on Facebook, for example, or other places, mm-hmm. or oh, this is a case study of somebody I work with, and this is how it will turn out. And even when it fails, I can say, this is what I did, and I, I made a mistake, and that didn't work. And I think that kind of honesty and just laying your cards on the table hmm. is better than any kind of marketing blurb and stuff like For me, I think, you know, that's how I feel. And I know since I've started doing that, uh, I, I, I've seen a lot more clients than I ever used to. Really? Even though it's all, yeah, oh yes. Even though it's online, um, and my teaching, my training courses have no problem. You know, I'm getting more people on my courses now than I did uh, two years ago. Wow. So, so it's it's good, you know, and it's just me being on video. And I think if I was starting out again, if I was a coach, son again, I first thing I would do is uh, make sure I have as many qualifications for that particular field mm-hmm. number two i would write books okay number th- number three i'd do conferences uh number four i'd probably specialize in something rather than being just general coaching specialize in a particular area 
and I suppose ideally some area which is profitable if you can. Right, right. right. So, so that you become known as an expert in that particular field because of who you are, the, the, the publications, etc. I didn't, I didn't, I mean, I published some things early on, but nothing. I didn't, I was very lazy. You know, I ended up someone writing a book about me because I couldn't, I never got around to writing a book myself. So somebody decided to write, write it for me. Which is, I was much, it's, more, it's more cool, isn't it? Somebody actually writes a book about you. Ah, so that, cool, that yeah. eventually <laughs> happened. But if I was going back again, I would have started, I would have started writing books. Wow. I mean, look at Bill, Bill O'Hanlon, for example. Oh, I mean, I how many books has, has he written? I don't think anyone knows. It's, uh, it's in the thousands. <laughs> <laughs> it's at least 20. I don't know. It might be 43 yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Paul Leslie. Have you heard of Paul Leslie? Do you know Paul Leslie? I don't know Paul Leslie, no. Oh, it's worth looking looking him up. He's uh, he's an Ericksonian. He's one of my students at some point, and I, I know he's uh, attended the, the Ericksonian conference, and uh, he's written about three or four books now, and he, I think he went to Bill and said, how do you do it? And ah. Bill taught him how, how to put books together, how to produce books. Bill is a great model for somebody who who makes money doing this sort of thing. He he teaches courses in how to write a book and how to how yep. to write a book and get it published and all that sort of stuff. He's yeah. got he's got a course for that. Um, yeah. he's an expert in it and teaches it well. So yeah. And and now a songwriter. You know about his songwriting. I know, I know, I know. He's doing great in in, in uh, Nashville. It's so exciting. Yeah, he um, sends he sends me some of his songs sometimes. Yeah, me too. That's great. Hey, um, you said doing conferences. You mean teaching at conferences, going to where you're a presenter at a conference? Yeah, yeah, where you're presenting. Okay. Well, you see, if you think about it, it's, it's a logical, you know, journey. If you, if you start off by you've got the relevant qualifications, you're respected by your peers, you then publish things. People read them, and people then want to come to train with you. You then get invited to conferences. To do, to do a presentation and mm-hmm. um, because you're a published author. And if you're in a specialized area, then you, you do those conferences specifically for that area, whether it's on a college like cancer or something, whatever, you can become a, a specialist in one particular area. And basically you'll, you'll probably end up being one of only a handful of people specializing in hypnotherapy with this particular problem. Right. That's right. what I would do. If I was starting all over again, I'd do it that way. Yeah. And it's an interesting thing about, you know, you want to call it niche marketing or uh, my friend Jason calls it niche because it rhymes with rich. Um, but, but what's curious about, <laughs> what's curious about having that specialty is that although yes, you have that specialty and are known for that specialty, people will come to you and say, Hey, do you also do this? And do you also do that? And they will come to you for other things outside mm-hmm. of that specialty because you are, you know, an expert so if you're an expert in this you Mm. must also be able to do this which is also by the way true you can Mm. do those other things as well outside of the oncology or whatever else it's about standing out yeah in one particular area once you stand out you know it's it's like if if you look at the entertainment business okay people who record songs they become famous singers they end up becoming actors or actresses right 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 right. they broaden out right and suddenly you know they can do all this other stuff and uh, it's the same thing yeah, Once you nice. become that, you do you do TV. You bec- you write columns in newspapers, and you know I just been so lazy not to kind of do it that way. You know I, when I started back in the se- in the seventy, I'm I'm seventy years old now, so I've been doing it a long time, about forty mm. forty five years, something like that. But if I'd have thought back then, what's gonna what's gonna work for me? I I would have actually done it differently. I would have put all those pieces into place. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I've had a great time. I mean, I've been very successful, so it's not really a problem. Well, one of the things I think is valuable about that sort of um, thinking about, you know, what sh- would I have done differently? What could I have done that would have been better is to say, and this is where I am now. How can I take that and say, and what can I do now to mm. make this better from here? You know, so if- yeah. when the, the old saying is, you know, when's the best time to have planted an oak tree? And I've been, well, 40 years ago. Because now you'd have an oak tree, <laughs> you'd be sitting under it having a picnic in the shade. But when's the second yeah, yeah. best time to plant an oak tree? Mm-hmm. Now, you know, yeah, yeah. get yeah. out there, plant your oak trees. Um, it's never too late. Yeah. Never too late. When I trained with Virginia Satir, there was a guy sitting next to me. We were both in the front row, okay, in the classroom. And his name was Alex. They still remember his name, Alex. And I turned to him and I said, uh, 
And I said, oh, well, you know, how old are you? Because he looked very, very old. Mm. And he said, he said, I'm 95. Oh, my God. And I said, you still need to come to courses like this at your age? He said, oh, no, this is a new career for me. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I still remember him, yeah? Wow. At 95, he decided to, have to uh, become a therapist. Wow, that's beautiful. But yeah, it's lovely, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> It is. Virginia Satir. Wow, that's so so nice. I, I wish I'd had an opportunity like that. Um, yeah. Well, Stephen, so you are in Thailand, so it's I, I can't, you know, imagine too many people are going to travel there to see you. But thank God we have this now. We have Zoom and yeah. uh, whatever else forms of mass communication. So if people wanted to book a session with you or book on a training course, how would they get hold of you, Stephen Brooks? Well, you can type in Stephen Brooks Hypnosis, it'll come up, um, or British Hypnosis Research, which is the name of the organization. Uh, I, all my training now is online. You know, it's all online, so it doesn't matter where people are in the world. Is Although I do run courses here, and I sometimes run them in London as well, but nice. online mainly. So S- stephenbrookshypnosis.com, or is it just Google, no, 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 just, Google just, that? Just Stephen Brooks, Stephen Brooks Hypnosis. Stephen Brooks Hypnotherapy, and they'll see British Hypnosis Research, and that's British Hypnosis Research. Beautiful, fantastic. Well, thank yeah. you so much for your time. It's been absolutely it's, fascinating. This hour has gone down amazingly yeah. quickly. It seems like we just started, but yeah, I've loved it. I've loved it. There's so many connections there. It's, yeah. it's really nice to meet someone who's actually walked the same kind of path yeah. and knows the, knows the same territory. It's and, and by the way, if I, if I if I could grow a beard like yours, I totally would. That's <laughs> That's an impressive achievement unto itself. If if nothing else on your deathbed, you go like, well, I did grow that beard that one. <laughs> well, by then it'll be down here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cha- channeling my inner wizard. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and you can have a new career. Yeah. Just yeah. like Alex. I could Stand turn up. my house into Hogwarts. <laughs> okay. Stay, stay, <laughs> okay. Okay. Take now. care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. This has been the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure seeing you again. Hope to see you again real soon. Come back next week when we have another gripping and exciting episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. And if you want to, you can find out more about us, each and every one of us, at EssentialCoachingSkills.com. Thanks. Thanks.